Truk, one of the main Jap naval bases in the Pacific, is raided on July 2nd by Liberators based on Eniwetok. Since Eniwetok was taken last February, it has become as extensive a staging base for our forces as it was for the Japs. Army and Navy aircraft crowd the airstrip. The harbor holds a great fleet, including aircraft carriers of the Essex class. First struck by naval aircraft on February 16th, truck was bombed during July at will, almost daily, depending on the weather. On this strike, each B-24 carried 40 100-pound general purpose bombs. The objective was heavy anti-aircraft gun emplacements on East Moan Peninsula. The run was made at 18,000 feet. Hits on the target were 90%. Jap fighters intercepted the formation, but kept out of range and did no damage. They withdrew after 15 minutes. On July 7th, B-24s dropped their 500-pound bombs on naval installations at Dublin. 40 tons found gun positions, a seaplane base, docks, and a warehouse. The most serious interception attempted recently cost the Japs five out of 14 planes. We lost one Liberator only lost from nearly 100 sorties flown against truck in a week. A Zeke dives through the formation. The following week, bad weather stopped raids three days. Then raids were routine until July 13th, when 15 to 20 Jap planes ineffectively attacked our formations with phosphorus bombs and machine gun and cannon fire. Naval base at Dublin, anti-aircraft batteries and airfields there and at Eton were principal targets. Large fires indicated heavy damage. The Japs lost five planes, four probables, and five damage. Several B-24s were hit by flak, but none was lost. A pilot's halo circles the shadow of a bomber. This rally photograph phenomenon was caught on the return trip. In Hawaii, the M10 and M33 chemical smoke tanks are tested on P-47s. The streamlined M10 is placed on a trailer for charging with the smoke agent. No filling is permitted on the field. All chemicals are kept in a dump. Tanks are filled through the air inlet opening. Precautions must be taken in handling the chemical mixture, for it's a casualty agent if encountered in liquid form. However, plain water will neutralize it. Here, the M33 is being filled. Tanks are taken to the line only when fully loaded. Special mountings on the wings secure the tank. They are fired by electrical contact through the same 12-volt standard airplane circuit that fires the outboard wing guns. Each tank has two hoisting lugs, reinforced by steel plates welded inside. The hoist that loads bombs is used for smoke tanks. Two carrier lugs attach the tank to the rack. When the bomb shackles are tightened, the detonator leads are connected in series. The air inlet vent and the discharge pipe are blocked off by one eighth inch glass plates. When detonators held against them by clips are exploded, the glass breaks and the chemical contents are released. The M10 was initially designed for A20s and the M33 for bomb bays of heavy bombers. Here, both are tested on P47s. The M10 is a streamlined tank which holds about 33 gallons, while the M33 has a much larger capacity. The smoke mixture here is FS sulfuric acid and sulfur trioxide. It weighs about 16 pounds per gallon. It reacts with the moisture in the air to form a white cloud of smoke. The density varies directly with that moisture content. And the smoke persists in direct relation to the wind velocity. At speeds of about 275 miles an hour, the M10 is discharged in about six seconds, depending on the various chemical fillings. The tanks can be dropped individually or in salvo.
In northern Corsica, operations of a 12th Air Force fighter group receives a call that one of its pilots has bailed out in the open sea north of Rome. The deputy controller, in constant contact with all planes, gets the message. In the fixer room, men plot bearings taken on the crippled plane by various fixer stations on the coast, and the fixer teller marks the spot where the man has gone into the sea. The location is marked by a pip on a plotting board and is also spotted on a large wall map. This information is also passed on to the fighter plotter who notes it on an interceptor board. From these markings, the deputy controller plots the course that rescue planes and boats will take. The sector controller, in charge of the whole operation, gives orders and all information to the rescue parties. At a walrus base, the pilot on duty receives word of the ditching over a phone reserved for rescue call. He and his gunner put on their May Wests and gather up their gear, while the ground crew prepares the plane for immediate takeoff. The pilot checks the position on the wall map and confers with the squadron commanding officer who has been studying and correlating all information. Tie down lines are cast off the standby walrus and the engine is started as the pilot and gunner run to their stations. These planes are always alerted and ready for takeoff at a moment's notice. The walrus taxis down the runway, and within minutes of the SOS being received at ASR headquarters, it's lifting into the air on its way to locate the downed airman. Meanwhile, the distress call has been relayed to a high-speed launch base. A crew is alerted while all available facts are noted. Crew members of the standby rescue launch stop whatever work they're doing and prepare to cast off. Lines are let go, engines are started, hatches are closed, and the boat slides away from the pier. As the rescue launch moves out of the harbor, the stern gunner takes his place. And by the time the boat passes the lighthouse at the end of the breakwater and heads for open sea, all hands are at their posts. Now with the walrus and the HSL both on their way, close coordination is maintained. As the search proceeds, any new information received at ASR headquarters is radioed to the rescue craft en route and their course revised accordingly. Once the downed flyer is sighted, the walrus circles the spot as a guide to the rescue launch that is now rapidly approaching. If necessary, a smoke bomb is released to indicate the flyer's position. When the launch nears the pilot, a cargo net is put over the side and crewmen stand by to climb down and help him aboard. As the HSL approaches the life raft, a line is thrown. The rescued man is hauled alongside and helped aboard. dry clothes are waiting for him, and so is a shot of rum. Later, on the way back to base, he gives the details of his ditching to the captain. Close cooperation between American and British forces has saved another pilot to fly again. Target Cecina, a main rail artery leading to southern Italy. Prior to the fall of Rome, fighter light and medium bombers disrupted enemy communications with concentrated attacks on bridges and viaducts. Railroad and highway spans here were hit many times, as in this marauder raid of April 14th on the bridges over the Cecina River.
These bombings were highly successful, as these pictures taken on July 7th show. The highway bridge was completely severed, and the railroad bridge on the Genoa-Rome line destroyed. Dive bombers did much to raise the score of hits here. Cecina was captured on July 1st after one of the stiffest battles in Italy since the occupation of Rome. It had been stubbornly defended in an attempt to bide time for Nazi forces organizing the Pisa Rimini line. Bypasses help restore highway traffic. From a blood bank in England go shipments of blood plasma and whole blood to save American lives in France. After processing, the whole blood is sent to a depot where it is stored in a 90-foot refrigerator until flown to Normandy. Soldiers and wax are donating much of this supply to meet the great need for whole blood. Emergency trucks stand by to rush the containers to nearby air bases. Each container holds 10 pints, and as they are transferred from the storage trays, each bottle and label is rechecked. Small containers of ice necessary to keep the blood fresh are placed between the bottles, and a large container of ice is packed on top. Lids are tightly closed, and the refrigerated units are loaded into trucks. Consignments of whole blood and blood plasma are taken to a 9th Air Force troop carrier base and put aboard C-47s, which flies it to France. Upon arrival at a landing strip in Normandy, the blood is transferred to an advanced blood bank refrigerator that's right at the airstrip. From there, it is transported by mobile refrigerated trucks to the various frontline field hospitals. This field hospital is a collecting station about three miles from the front. Casualties are brought in on litters and litter jeeps. Here, whole blood is administered. Beyond this point, blood plasma is used. The plasma is delivered in the midst of battle to a front-line aid post for emergency transfusion. These dressing stations in this area are no more than slit trenches concealed by hedgerows. Their equipment includes camouflaged ambulances and litter jeeps. Only three to four hundred yards from enemy lines, they are constantly under fire. Conditions are extremely adverse for this kind of work. Medical facilities are sparse, transportation limited. At this particular aid station, only one jeep and one ambulance, recaptured after a German counter-thrust five hours before, were available. Against these handicaps, a magnificent job is being done in administering plasma. On every battlefront, the Red Cross Blood Donor Service is helping to save lives. Back at the field or evacuation hospital, a severely wounded man is brought into the emergency tent for a whole blood transfusion. The 
The bottles are hung from tent ropes, and the blood seeps through a drip filter, a transparent glass tube, directly into the man's bloodstream. Fighter planes patrolling western sectors of France continue to shoot up road, rail, and water transport. Gunsight aiming point cameras record some of their activities. Black firsts from this well-defended area. bomb trailing 20 feet of flame is attacked by fighters as it heads for England. Its wingspan is 16 feet, overall length 25 feet 4.5 inches. Gyro controlled, it's driven by a jet propelled engine. It consumes about a gallon of low grade aviation gas per mile, limiting range of the present V1 to about 150 miles. However, larger bombs have appeared, indicating the range has already increased. This type carries a little more than a ton of explosive in its nose. Care must be taken in shooting them down, lest they fall in populated areas, and lest the fighter plane itself be destroyed by the explosions. 